Hello, in this tutorial, my teammate and I will go over some of the main methods of evaluating the performance of supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithms. First, to properly evaluate the machine learning model, it is essential to make sure that the dataset used for the evaluation is not the same as the dataset used for training the model. This is important to avoid the problem of overfitting, which means that the model just memorizes the training dataset, thus it predicts a correct label for any point in the set. However, it's unable to generalize its learning on unseen data. In holdout method, the dataset we use for constructing a machine learning model is split into three subsets. The training data used to teach and build the model, validation data used to search for the best model architecture through assessing the performance of the trained model and tuning the model's parameters, and test data used to perform an unbiased evaluation of the model and calculate the different metrics, metrics which quantify the performance of the model. For machine learning problems with limited or not big enough amount of data, Training dataset is given the highest portion of the split. Enough portion for the validation dataset is still needed to, to evaluate the performance of the model. So, k-folds cross-validation method is used. K-folds cross-validation allows for training and testing the, the model simultaneously, so as to benefit from the available dataset as much as possible. This is done through splitting the training dataset into k-subsets, the folds, and performing k-learning experiments on the dataset, each time taking one fold as the evaluation subset and the rest as the training subset. The average generalization error estimate of all trials describes the performance of the model accurately. Testing the finalized model is then happens after this phase on a separate unseen dataset. Classification models output a class or label for a given input data. Binary classifications have two possible output classes, and multi-class classifications have more. The overall accuracy can measure how often a classifier makes the correct prediction, but it is not enough. A confusion matrix shows a more detailed breakdown of a correct and incorrect classification for each class. To decrypt the matrix, we need to understand four different values true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative. True positive is when the predicted value matches the, the actual value which is positive. True negative is when the predicted value matches the act, actual value too, but the value is negative in this case. False positive is when the predicted value was positive, but the actual value is negative. And the false negative is when the predicted value was negative, but the actual value was positive this time. We can derive some metrics from the confusion matrix, like the precision, recall, and F1 score. The precision is a useful metric in cases where the false positive is a higher concern than false negatives. It's important in music, video recommendation systems, e-commerce websites, and such. While the recall is a useful metric in cases where false negative is more important than false positive, it's used in medical cases where it doesn't matter whether we raise a false alarm, but the actual positive cases should not never go undetected. In practice, when we try to increase the precision of our model, the recall goes down, and vice versa. The F1 score captures both trends in a single value, but there is a catch here. The interpretability of the F1 score is poor. This means that we don't know what our classifier is maximizing, precision or recall. So we use it in combination with other evaluation metrics, which gives us a complete picture of the results. The receiver operating characteristic curve is one of the most important evaluation metrics for checking any classification model's performance. It is a plot of the true positive rate against the false negative rate for all possible classification thresh thresholds which show the sensitivity of the classifier. It shows how many correct positive classifications can be gained as more and more false positives are allowed. Its benefit over any other metric is that it presents the performance of the classifier 
on all possible classification thresholds, not only at a single threshold point. However, the thresholds used to generate the ROC cannot actually be seen on the, on the curve itself. A classifier that does a good job at separating the classes will have an ROC curve hugging the upper left corner of the plot. Conversely, the ROC curve hugging the diagonal line represents a classifier that does a bad job. The diagonal line essentially represents a classifier that randomly guesses no more. It can be hard to compare several ROC curves to each other. So to compare classifiers, we use AUC. AUC means area under the curve, is a way to quantify the ROC curve and summarize it into a single number, thus allowing an efficient comparison of different models. AUC measures the entire two-dimensional area underneath the entire ROC, from point 0.00 to point 0.11. A good classifier has a curve closest to the upper right of the graph, thus the biggest AUC. AUC range, ranges in values from 0 to 1. A model whose prediction are 100% wrong has an AUC of 0. One whose prediction are 100% correct has an AUC of 1. When AUC is 0 0.5, it means the model has no class separation capacity whatsoever. Much like the ROC curve, Precision Recall Curve is used for evaluating the performance of classification algorithms. It provides a graphical representation of a classifier's performance across many thresholds, rather than a single one. The figure here demonstrates how some theoretical classifiers would plot on a PR curve. The gray dotted line represents a baseline classifier. This classifier would simply predict that all instances belong to the positive class. The purple line represents an ideal classifier, one with perfect precision and recall at all thresholds. A good classifier will maintain both a high precision and a high recall across the graph and will hug the upper right corner in the figure. The information in a precision recall curve can be summarized with a single value, AUC PR metric, just like the ROC curve. It stands for Area Under the Precision Recall Curve. Generally, the higher the AUCPR score, the better a classifier performs for a given task. One way to calculate AUCPR is to find the AP, or the average precision. In a perfect cl classifier, AUCPR equal 1. In a basic classifier, the AUCPR will depend on the fraction of observation belonging to the positive class. For example, in a balanced binary classification dataset, the baseline class classifier will have AUCPR equal 0.5. A classifier that provides some predictive value will fall between the baseline and the perfect classifier. The performance of machine learning algorithms can be tested by using regression models matrix. First, we can use mean absolute error. It measures performance of models which are applied on continuous variables. It is the average of the difference between the original value and the predicted value. It is used to know how far the predictions are from the actual output. Second, we can use root mean squared error, which is an another measure which is commonly used in regression problems and tells you how will your model, how your model uh, perform. Coefficient of determination. It is the amount of the variation in the output dependent attribute which is predictable from the input independent variables. It is, used to, it is used to check how well observed results are reproduced by the model, depending on the ratio of total deviation of results described by the model. To make this tutorial interactive and easy, I used to put an example on each regression model metric. So first I started with an example uh, talking about mean absolute error. So as we see we have a table containing actual values, predicted values, residuals and mean absolute errors. So residuals is the absolute value of the difference between actual value and predicted value. So after finding the residuals 
we can add them we can add the elements inside the residuals then divide them by the number of data points so here the number of data points are equal to 5 so that we can get the mean absolute error of this example so here we use the same example from the previous slide but we add the RMSE column so we first calculate the residuals which is equal to the subtraction of the actual value and the predicted values then we square them after that we can add all the elements inside the residuals after that we can divide them by n which is the total sample points then we can do the square root to get the RMSE values so it is clearly that we have a difference in MAE values uh, between MAE and RMSE values so here it can shows that RMSE has more strict behavior than MAE with large errors namely it tells us RMSE is sensitive to error distribution of samples because of the squaring of the residual if you compare two last columns we will see that the value of RMSE is always greater than or equal to MAE values values are equal only if all residuals are equal or uh, are equal to zero in this example we designed a table with actual and predicted values to find the coefficient of determination so first we calculate the mean value which gave us a value of 8 after that we subtract the predicted values from the actual values then we squared them after that we, uh, we add them all together to get uh, a value equal to 9 we do the same, the, the same thing uh, for the next column so that we can get also a value uh, equal to 14 after we get all the values we can now use the formula above so that we get uh, the coefficient of determination equal to 0.35 or 35 percent this means in this example the data given don't fit the regression model because 35 percent means that only 35 percent percent of the data fits this regression model in conclusion when r2 is high when r squared is high that means that the data given fits the regression model in general higher coefficient indicates a better fit for a model in this slide we are going to discuss the performance evaluation of real-life models so here we have three models ARIMA, GARSH and Kalman filter ARIMA is actually a class of models that explains a given time series based on its own past values it is also can be used to forecast future values GARSH is a statistical model that can be used to analyze a number of different types of financial data for instance macroeconomic data Kalman filter is an algorithm that combines information about the state of a system using predictions based on a physical model and noisy measurements it is called a filter because it is filtering out measurement noise so in this example above it is clear that the performance of arima and kalman filter is much better than the other two models so kalman model is the best uh, is the best approach to use since the mae value and the rmse value of arima of arima and kalman is much lower than the arima model separate and also the same thing for arima and garsh model Clustering is the most common unsupervised machine learning algorithm. Clustering models aim to cluster or group the, in the input data into clusters based on the similarity of the features of the data. Evaluating the results of clustering algorithms is a very important part of the process, but it is not an easy task. Multiple techniques and metrics exist for this purpose, especially given that the evaluation method often depends on the clustering algorithm itself. 
Generally, there are two types of clustering evaluations. Internal criteria-based validation, which is based on information that involves the vectors of the data set themselves, and external criteria-based validation, which depends on previously specified structures of the data. In the real world, it is less often to have problems with previous information about the data set. In this tutorial, we will focus on internal validation. Generally speaking, two types of internal validation metrics called indices are used, cohesion and separation. Cohesion evaluates how close elements in the same cluster are to each other. It is an intra-cluster metric, so cohesion is measured within a cluster. Separation measures the level of separation between clusters. It is an inter-cluster measure, so it is measured between clusters. These metrics allow for different algorithms to be compared to one another under the same evaluation criterion when no additional information about the data is available. Calculating these two measures is based on a proximity function that measures how similar two samples are. A clustering model is a good model when it has a high separation between clusters and a high cohesion within clusters. Instead of dealing with separate metrics for cohesion and separation, there are several metrics that try to quantify the level of separation and cohesion in a single value. The silhouette coefficient is the most common way to combine the cohesion and separation metrics in a single measure. The computation of the silhouette coefficient for a sample depends on the average distance to all the samples in the same cluster and the minimum average distance between the sample and the samples in each cluster not containing the analyzed sample. It provides a simple framework for qualification where it is defined between minus 1 and 1. Positive values indicate high separation between clusters. Negative values are an indication of overlapping clusters. And when silhouette coefficient is 0, it indicates that the data is uniformly distributed. A downside to silhouette coefficient is its high computational complexity, which makes it impractical when dealing with huge datasets. Another metric is Don's index. It is the ratio of the smallest distance between data from different clusters and the largest distance between clusters. So large intercluster distances or better separation and smaller cluster sizes or more compact clusters lead to a higher Don's index. This implies better clustering performance, meaning that the clusters are compact and well separated from each other. There are so many methods and metrics that can be used to evaluate the performance of machine learning algorithms. These metrics are tied to the machine learning task, and choosing the suitable methods and metrics for our model depends greatly on the available resources, from data and tools, and on the end goal of the model, and what functionalities it should optimize. Our understanding of methods of evaluating the performance of machine learning has impressively developed over the last decades and it is still improving as our understanding of machine learning is. From realizing that a single measure is not enough, to new methods and ways emerging every day to further assess the performance accurately.